I'd like to talk about um, uh, a topic that hopefully will complement what you've heard from Bob and uh, and Marie and Amit. And um, so I'm going to show you some statistics about the, the education deficit that we have. Um, this is where I'm from, the University of Utah. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest that are relevant, but I am um, uh, actually a board member of the Pan-Arab Neurosurgical Society. But I just wanted to show this slide, which shows the uh, demographics of neurosurgical coverage around the world. And um, as you'd predict, uh, America, um, uh, most of Europe, uh, is, is well saturated, and, and some of Asia is very well saturated with neurosurgeons, but there's huge deficits obviously in Central and South America, Africa, as you'd predict, but also Asia, and I just want to point that out, and I'm going to show some data about that uh, later. Uh, what is the educational target? Well, this is an interesting slide. This is the um, number of cases done worldwide in neurosurgery, so 13.8 million. Um, and you can see where they're done. So only less than a million, 665,000 is done in the United States and Canada. So just a small number. Most of the neurosurgery is done in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific. Um, the other important uh, statistic I want to show you is the type of pathology. So 45% of the surgeries worldwide are for trauma, okay? And then you can see down the line stroke, hydrocephalus, brain tumors, aneurysms and AVMs only 2.2%, and spinal tumors only 0.1%, um, which is very interesting. Even in Japan, which is a, you know, is a high income country, uh, well saturated with neurosurgeons, the most frequent thing that they do is trauma. So I think we forget about this fact uh, in our day to day practice. So this was an interesting paper published showing the most highest cited papers in neurosurgery. And um, there's no correlation uh, with what the demographics of what the world is doing. So uh, vascular was uh, numbers 37 uh, of those, a tumor 27, trauma 19, so third on the list, and spinal cord injury was only three papers. So completely uh, disconnect. Uh, between what the world is doing and what we're publishing on, um, which is interesting. So are we missing the boat? There seems to be a mismatch between the clinical needs and what our academic output uh, represents. So this is I, 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 a sort of at the feet. This is an American phenomenon because you'll see that most of the publications are coming from uh, North America. American neurosurgery academic output does not represent what is being done on a worldwide basis. We're largely speaking to ourselves, although I would say this is an important role because we're the, the technical leaders um, in, in our specialty. And we're only a minor component of worldwide neurosurgical workforce. In fact, the Australasian Neurosurgical Society represents two-thirds of the world's neurosurgeons. Uh, and so we're only a minority. So the other thing that's happening is that there's a change in the epidemiological trends of uh, trauma. And in, in Western Europe, uh, this is written by Ander Moss and uh, Bob Rosenbeek, um, but it shows a change in epidemiological patterns of TBI. The median age of individuals is increasing. It's us baby boomers that are aging. And falls have now surpassed road traffic accidents as leading cause of this injury. So that's what it is in Western Europe and uh, North America. Um, and this is a typical case, and we all see these in our daily practice, uh, in both private practice and an academic practice, where you have a 71-year-old in this case comes in, and he's taking clopidogrel, and he deteriorates, and then he's got this worsening um, because he's bleeding into his contusion and into the subdural space. But in the developing world, this is a picture from India. This is the problem. It's the motorization of the developing world. And this is a, a changing demographic then now that road traffic accidents are becoming increasingly comma. And in fact, you see this with this projection that was done. So in 2004, road traffic accidents represented number nine of the leading cause of death. And now they're expected to increase by, uh, to number five by 2000 and, uh, 
and 30 in this case, or 2030. And I would also point out, as Marie just mentioned, diabetes is increasing because of worldwide obesity. And uh, HIV is going to be sur surpassed here by uh, road traffic accidents worldwide. So there's an increase in TBI in developing countries due to immobilization and more epidural and acute subdural hematomas and changes in the TBI population in Europe, Japan, and in America with the older patients, uh, anticoagulants, and falls. So why developing countries should have a voice in publication? And I think this gets at the, the disconnect between what we're educating in America and what the world really needs is if you look at the, this is an interesting paper, looked at the instance of global uh, traumatic brain injury in different countries, and you know, they had a higher incidence in North America. Well, it's hard to believe that North America's got a higher incidence than Central Africa. So this is a, a defect in, in data collection and systems to be able to, to study the population. And I think that is emblematic of the problem. Are the available resources important for TBI management? So this is a typical American critical care unit that you're all familiar with, um, with you know, multi-component monitoring for TBI or ICP or blood pressure or O2 saturation, whatever you wish to measure. Uh, Lycox monitor is popular in our place. Uh, but in developing countries, this is the situation. In India, in fact, it's amazing because I do. I've done a lot of surgery in India. Is that the the family is incorporated into the care team, and it's wonderful. You could never do that in America, but um, but the family and the mother will stand by the side and make sure that the the patient breathes. And if they've got a trach, they'll they'll bag the patient. It's amazing. They won't be on a ventilator. There's not enough ventilators, and um, and there's not enough uh, physicians to take care of them. So here's a typical. Uh, a place in, in Asia where you've got 40 admissions and 10 trauma operations per day, and this is the ICU lineup. You know, we're obsessed with uh, technology in this country, with image guidance, the best microscopes, OBI, um, robotics um, in your microscope, and uh, also placing um, uh, SEEG, intraoperative imaging, robotics, but this is the situation in developing countries. So what they've done here is they just need magnification. So they're using a smartphone, you know, very clever, you know, practical solution uh, to the problem that they have. So this type of treatment is really not relevant for a lot of the world that we're talking about. And I know that I see Mick, there's some high-end spine people here, and, uh, but that's not, what we need to base, basis, uh, base our education efforts on. So this is a point, and I'm, I got some of these slides from um, uh, Franco Servade, who's the president of the WFNS, and he makes the point, and um, I just want to emphasize this, is that we, we do these studies where we look at um, ICP measurements and adequate care for the post-operative traumatic brain injury, but if a country does not have enough resources to buy an ICP monitor, are there enough resources to pay for three CTs a week to, to sort of see the evolution of the trauma and the contusion? So a lot of the countries are just not even in the game, and I think that's where the deficit is. So only 4.4% of publications come from uh, low-income and low-middle-income countries. India and Egypt are the most frequent ones, as you can imagine. And there's a smattering of other countries that you can see here. But 97% of the publications come from the top 15 countries here. And the US is responsible for a, a clear third of all the documents published. Uh, for 4 to 5% of the reviews and actually close to 80% of the guidelines. And the question is, are they relevant to the world? How do we improve the publication rate? So this is an example of a, of a way to do it. This is the Global Neurotrauma Outcome Study uh, run under the auspices of the WFNS and an NIHR Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. And uh, what they did is they developed uh, specific guidelines 
for countries, and in this case, Uganda, and they explored the use of a hospital-based register for measuring burden and outcomes. So we need to get the underdeveloped countries and the lower income countries to be part of publishing and educating their own population, as, as, as Bob made the point so well this morning, is that we need to help them educate themselves. Um, we did this issue a couple of years ago in Neurosurgical Focus. Uh, Bob read an editorial on this as well. And uh, on the inequities that we see, and you've seen lots of examples of that. I want to show some other clever things that are happening uh, contemporarily. Uh, this is a, we've got an issue coming out in Neurosurgical Focus, I think, next month on uh, international education. And this was a submitted paper that will be published, but I've known about this. This is like a dating app for neurosurgeons insofar as what they do is they is designed to intend on increasing global partnerships in neurosurgery, both traditional and virtual. And so uh, a neurosurgeon in an underdeveloped part of the world can, um, can actually link up in a collaborative fashion for research and education. And this was developed by a pediatric neurosurgeon, uh, very clever, and partnerships have been formed uh, that uh, between international visits between high income countries and low middle income countries, but also telecollaboration. And so the world is flattening, and I want to just emphasize that. So this is another paper that's coming out in the issue next month by Neil Nanda's group, but it shows that there's variability in what we're asking our residents to do from a research productive standpoint. And I think it starts with the resident education in that we need to make contributions to the literature and study part of resident education. And there's huge variability between research output between countries, even be among low and low middle income countries. So it's remarkably different. And we need to develop some uniformity in our training standards and a research curriculum within our training as well. So. <clears throat> this was uh, uh, an, a very interesting paper, again, that will be published next month. And um, this is a, uh, a, a review of countries in South and, and Southeast Asia. And I just wanted to say that every country is different and has its own problems and separate issues. So you take a high-income country like Japan, which we know is well resourced with neurosurgeons. They've got more neurosurgeons than I think any country in the world, one for every 13,000 uh, population. Uh, but we see other countries, one in 733,000, 780,000. So there's non-uniformity among countries in the same geographical region. So it, it's, it's really a challenge, and we need to get you know, really on the ground with every one of these countries. So the world is flattening. And I want to make a pitch saying that along with all the beautiful efforts you've seen today uh, that have been described by the previous speakers, we need to use the web and education resources to help flatten the world. And everybody knows just going to YouTube has really changed the game as far as educating among so many different ways. But I just want to give a plug to, um, to Aaron Cohen Goodall, who started this atlas. And, <laughs> and does these grand rounds. And I just wanted to point out that the most watched grand rounds is this one here, patient positioning. So a simple, fundamental uh, series. Um, and this is what the people need. You know, this is what is being watched and being appreciated. Uh, remember the simplest of topics and make them accessible. I think that's the key. So he developed this atlas, and this is his web hits. But I just want to point out that he just recently developed a Google app to go along with his atlas. And you can see the changes just in, just in a few months from this to now other countries are using it. So the young people are tech savvy. And um, they're very quick to pick up on these types of educational tools. This emphasizes this. This is a demographic information over time. And you can see us older people. We're not very tech savvy, but we're getting better. <laughs> but also look at the females. Went from 30 to 41. They're almost equal with males now. So 
the population is very, very tech savvy. The young people are very good, and we need to use that as an opportunity. I will just want to finish by saying a couple of things that the whole concept between free web education was really epitomized by neurosurgical focus when it started 23 years ago by Marty Weiss. And we have a, f a topic every month, and the idea is that we pick topics that are relevant to the world, not just for American neurosurgery. So don't we, we don't pick American-specific topics. And, um, and we've recently started this video uh, journal um, just to, to actually utilize the, the power of the web and the video as an educational tool. And uh, the operative techniques are the corner of the realm of what we do. They're widely valued and viewed. There's a tremendous educational resource, and it helps flatten the world. So we started this video journal um, this year, and we look at articles that have operative anatomy, surgical techniques, surgical approaches, complications, new technology, and uh, we've also developed an operative forum. But it's a world platform. It's free access. And the idea is I'm going to show you some statistics. We've had a 50% increase in submissions just in the last year. And I think it emphasizes we need to take the value of the web as an educational resource. It's an amazing, amazing tool. I, I can't tell you from over the last decade the difference between low middle income countries and the sophistication level 10 years ago compared to now. And it's largely in part due to free access. People want to be able to go on the computer. They don't want to pay. They don't want to sign in. They just want free access to the material and the education. We should get them. We should give them. So we need to be involved internationally. And you've seen some of the best representation from our specialty, Bob, Marie, Amit, and a number of you in the audience that have been involved with this. We need to support WFNS and FIENDS. And as surgical leaders, we need to take the time to help others in continental region and, nurse and national societies. And they're looking towards America to help them organize. This is what I think we do better than in other parts of the world, is organize ourselves and our educational efforts. And we can be role models in that way, as Bob exemplified. You need to take time and do it and spend the time. Um, I, every year I go to Egypt and we do a cadaver course. Morocco. I mean, I, I also take fellows. I, take, I try to take international fellows every year and not just American trained fellows um, so that they'll go back and they'll be leaders in their own country and, and then also um, be specialists in that particular area. So all of you know this already, but these terrible cases that they take care of, I'm so amazed by the quality of the average neurosurgeon in some of these busy places. If you go to Ames in India, I want to send our hospital administrators there because they do an amazing job, and they're skilled surgeons, and they do an amazing job of taking care of people for a low amount of resources. And they're efficient, they're fast, and, and they've got their processes so wired um, to make them so, like they only spend six hours in the ICU after surgery and they do a scan. And if the scan looks good, they move them onto the floor. It's amazing the processes that they use and something that we can all learn from. We're starting an international rotation now for our residents to go over just to, for that aspect. Because I think we in America are so spoiled and we think the resources are endless, but they're really doing a terrific job with much less. And uh, these amazing cases that you see, I will tell you it's a challenge because they always throw the most difficult cases at you <laughs> and uh, you're jet lagged and, and you're out of your comfort zone, but you need to take the time and do it. Um, I also want to give a plug to uh, uh, Isabel Germano who developed the WFNS education courses, and a number of us are involved with that. Fiends, you've heard from Bob today. But um, it's a brave new world. And uh, happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs>